Welcome to The Wine Pod. I'm Chris Wofford. I'm Cheryl Stanley. And today we are going to be talking about um, various wine app appellations, designations, uh, indications, all of, this, all of this information that sometimes we encounter on wine bottles that either is completely mysterious to us mm -hmm. or intimidating, kind exactly. of at the same time. Uh, what is this all about? What, what are these systems about? Um, how does this kind of work? Give us a framework for understanding here. So, boils down to a sense of place. Okay. Telling you where the grapes are from. Now, mm -hmm. there are certain places that have much more rules and regulations, but generally speaking, if we have to say about the world of wine, a designation of place is just where the grapes are from. And this is something that is uh, particular. Uh, the, the, the framework, the regulatory bodies are unique to countries, right? Correct. That's, that's how this works. And it can go even unique to the specific area. So you can mm -hmm. have a governing board of the area which will write the rules and regulations associated with that area. What is the point? Uh, you know, you had mentioned that um, you know it's to it's to inform us as the consumer, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, obviously, producers are involved on the other side to let us know where something comes from. Is there any other motivation to do this? Is it you know we had talked before? Is this a, is this a guarantee of quality? For instance, you're gonna love my answer, Chris. Okay. <laughs> it depends. On what? <laughs> well, it depends on well. I should say, the producer. Quality always boils down to the producer. Mm -hmm. You could have a controlled and guaranteed wine from Italy, but mm -hmm. one producer is going to be different than the next. Their sure. vineyards, their sourcing is going to be different from another. Mm -hmm. So the place is going to give you a sense, but then the next step is you as a consumer has to do, have to do more research about the the specific producer and their and, and their method of production if it's not completely dictated by the rules and regulations of that place. So let's take a case study. Let's look at France, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. So when we look at France, uh, we see on bottles, we see Burgundy, Beaujolais, more specifically, then we'll get into like Chateauneuf de Pop, Chablis, Fleury, like we had last week. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way down to like one side of the river. Yes, <laughs> that, you know what exactly. I mean? One vineyard, X marks the spot, gets a Grand Cru, yeah. whereas five you know feet down the lane mm -hmm. it's a named place but it's not even classified it's just a village and mm -hmm. and what makes that difference you mm -hmm. know so a lot of these rules and especially the designation of place in european countries have you know are hundreds of years old these vineyards have been recognized you know starting with the monks mm -hmm. um even the vineyards in in portugal and and specifically the port area up in the doro valley were demarcated in the 1700s because they recognized certain vineyards were better than the other mm -hmm. then as the regulations came about specifically in the 1900s uh you know in france in 1933 then in 1935 you're looking at okay putting some rules and regulations associated with it. Now, what's the correlation between, uh, you know, the geographical location and um, soil types, for instance, right? Or the amount of water, drainage, all of that kind of stuff sort of figures into this stuff, or how does that work? It does, because if you're going all the way down to a single vineyard, mm -hmm. that single vineyard, as you mentioned, is going to have different soil. So that soil can impact the flavor of the grapes then transmits into the finished wine. So mm -hmm. yes, a wine from one vineyard could have a different flavor pro and aroma profile compared to a vineyard next door. So it, it does take a lot of palate mileage when you <laughs> sure. get into these yep. these single vineyards. But I think it's you know just understanding the difference and giving a consumer, giving someone confidence and like, oh, okay, I know where this place is. Mm -hmm. And there are there are restrictions sometimes prohibitively. We talked about the Vouvray scandal of 2014. Tell us about that. First of all, Vouvray. What are we talking about? What Vouvray, kind of wine? Well, Vouvray is a beautiful white wine producing area, and they produce sparkling wines as well in the Loire Valley of France. Mm -hmm. And they're known for their Chenin Blanc. And you had in 2014 the regulatory board of the Vouvray AOC came in and said, okay. If you want to use Vouvray on your label, which demands more money in the market, mm -hmm. you have to grow the grapes, make the wine, and bottle the wine within the Vouvray AOC. There mm -hmm. are a couple producers who had just built some new production facilities outside of the Vouvray AOC. So they were put in a little bit of a conundrum. Do I take my Chenin Blanc and ferment it and bottle it outside of the AOC and then have to declassify it so I can't make as much money? Or do I keep my winery, my production facilities within the AOC yeah. uh, and be able to, to bottle it as Vouvray? 
So then now you are carrying the cost of two wineries and not one. Good. So we just covered France, Italy. How does how is it uh, Italy structured similarly or different? Yes, Italy is structured similarly. They have an extra step. They have the controlled and guaranteed, the DOCG level, which you'll see on the label, mm -hmm. and that takes a tasting step. So you know you asked that question earlier about quality. So here you have that tasting step. If it doesn't meet the quality as designated by the tasting board of the area, that fruit or that wine will have to be declassified. And we see this in France and Italy as well. Certain areas, um, maybe we're at the regional level, the IGT or IGP level for the various countries, yeah. protected geographic indication, but they've produced really, really good wine. And so the government is looking at actually elevating them up to an AOC or in Italy's case, a DOC. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, Germany. There's there's lots going on in Germany. There are lots of things going on in Germany, and it's it's an exciting time. Mm -hmm. uh, as an educator and as a lover of German wines, though, I'm still trying to get my feet um, underneath the new classification because sure. it's for those of you that are familiar with with Burgundy and kind of what we were talking about having the classification go to the specific vineyard. Mm -hmm. That is something that we're seeing now at the national level, um, which historically you have the Verban Deutscher Pradikats Weinguter, the VDP, the producer classification, who already had a structured pyramid yeah. of regional village and then the single vineyard classifications for Premier Cru and Grand Cru. Um, but now we're seeing it on the national level as well. And this is due to wrap up, we were just talking a minute ago, 2025 or something like that. Yes, yes. They'll have until 2025 to kind of figure out which vineyards are going to be, you know, good enough to be named at like the first crew level. Mm -hmm. um, but then you'll have the best vineyards as well. We've got a couple German wines to taste here. We do. What are we digging we into? We do. So we have a regional Mosul. Okay. okay. And that's something that many consumers are comfortable with. They see Mosul, they know it's a high quality wine producing area. This is a river valley. This is a river valley, a very, very curvy river valley. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you see Mosul, great. You recognize the place, you know it's going to have high acidity, um, various sweetness levels depending on the wine. Okay. And this specific wine is the Zillikin. It's an estate. Riesling, um, and this producer has vineyard sourcing primarily in the Tsar River, but they labeled it as Mosul because it's reflective of the general Riesling, uh, mm -hmm. general region. Sure. And then we're going to compare it actually to a single vineyard, mm -hmm. a VDP Grossalaga, and again, I mentioned that the VDP already has this classification structure of recognizing the best vineyards. Um, and this is specifically from the Josef Hofer vineyard. But, you know, let's just kind of look at the wines. If we look okay. at the wines color-wise, there's, the Josef Hofer is, is just a little bit uh, more intense mm -hmm. in, in color. Mm -hmm. But both of them are, are fairly pale straw. Yes. You know, nothing crazy in, in terms of differences. Mm -hmm. And then if we smell, we smell the wine, both of them smell like Riesling. Right. And that's really? that's the great mm. thing is even with these new classifications, Germany and, and, you know, even Austria in the future, they're they're going to label by variety. So you'll know as a consumer, OK, this is Riesling. I like Riesling. But it's the other terms on the labels that like a village that you might not be familiar with or a vineyard that you might need to just get your phone out and Google. And it's OK. We talk about sugar levels mm -hmm. uh, at harvest too, right? That's the the cabinet designation that's on there. The cabinet, yes, the Prati Cots vine. Uh, it's okay. it's part of within the uh, wine with special attributes. So cabinet is the the base level of ripeness uh, within the Prati Cot. Perfect. And then if a producer harvests, well, and this is what's also interesting with these new classifications, they are designating certain grape varieties in certain vineyards as well as certain ripeness levels at harvest. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Let's taste. Okay. Oh, we forgot our spit cups today. Oh, we sure did. <laughs> Isn't this beautiful? Oh, man. I mean, it's just beautiful, bright acidity, yellow flowers, apples, peaches, um, gorgeous. This is a beautiful expression of Mosul, of the Mosul. 
it's uh, it's a stunner. Um, mm -hmm. We're gonna share the uh, the names of each of these wines as we go through with the audience via chat. Just oh. letting you know, heads up for that audience. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, then let's get to our VDP Gross Lager. Okay. So VDP Gross Lager. This is the Josef Hofer again. This is a specific vineyard within the Mosul. Similar nose. Similar yeah. nose, right? Same the peaches, apricots, white flowers. Still, that beautiful Mosul Syrian acidity yep. is gorgeous. You know, this wine they label as a fine air. So that means it's off dry. It has a little bit of residual sugar to it. Yep. But the acidity balance, it's just, it appears dry almost mm -hmm. on the palate. Um, and so it's hard to say, you know, what's what's the difference? What What is the difference between the Mosul versus the Yosef offer? You know, a little bit more intensity, mm -hmm. intensity in color, intensity in, in flavor mm -hmm. um, and aromas. But both of these are, are beautiful wines. They really are. They're, they're like a bouquet. Exactly. Really exactly. Gorgeous. And, you know, as you, if you want to kind of play some fun games, do some fun events, you can get pro uh, one producer and go up the pyramid with that producer and oh. try and even pick out what are the, the slight nuances between the wines. I'm so glad you brought these two. Those are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Austria, similar similar deal with Germany as from a regulatory standpoint, right? Yes, uh, What's going they on there? they are also you know they were for well, I should say on a national level, um, you had the some designations mm -hmm. already. Yep. Um, they're expanding it uh, once you hit the DAC or the controlled um, Austrian districts, then you can go for regional um, and village regional village and a uh, single vineyard and just like the vdp in germany this that producer classification there were producer there are producer classifications that have been recognizing special vineyards on labels uh for decades what are some of the premier wines that come out of austria um they, they do riesling similarly they dry riesling yeah. um also i mean we can't gruner vetliner gruner yes. vetliner beautiful and and one thing is these Gruner Vetliners can age, especially oh, yeah? they're they're not like the the crown cap under ten dollar types. Leader, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's these wines. You know, I have some in my cellar that are twenty five years old that just take on this creaminess, this intensity of flavor. Um, but I know there are certain vineyards in certain. Um, vintages that mm -hmm. age better than others. Perfect, glad mm -hmm. I asked. Okay, so let's talk about non-European countries. Yes. Um, old world versus new world, breaking away from that type of terminology you mentioned. Yes, um, you know, recognizing that uh, they're European and non-European. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and really highlighting that they're different, they have different laws, um, mm -hmm. and, and going away from New World and Old World. Let's talk about the um, the AVAs, the U.S. official app appellations, uh, you know, the American Viticultural Area is yes. what we use here. Um, how does this kind of play out, California, for example? Let's use that as, as a case study. And California is a perfect one because they produce 85% of the wine, or approximately, in the United States. Yep. Uh, it's the designation of place. Mm -hmm. But it does not dictate to the producer what grape variety you are allowed to grow, method of production, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, you know, states have the right to create stricter labeling laws um, and the percentage that of grapes that must be from that AVA or American Viticultural Area. Uh, but it's it's really telling us as a consumer, this is where the grapes are from. So when we see on a bottle, uh, this is nothing, probably nothing to the audience, but we'll see things like Napa Valley, Sonoma Valley. Mm -hmm. And then and now California is drawing, you know, drawing down even further. Uh, we've got something from, um, where, where's that right, California? Right, the Oak, Oak Knoll District where? Uh, within Napa Valley. Okay. So it's, it's fun for the two wines that we selected for California. We actually did a North Coast 
AVA and North Coast AVA is a collection is a is a very large area, mm -hmm. but it's made up of uh, parts of multiple counties. So Napa County, Sonoma County, Lake County, Mendocino County mm -hmm. are the primary ones, and then we have a very very small AVA in Napa Valley or with it. So it's kind of like concentric circles. Yeah. Napa County down to Napa Valley, and then the Oak Knoll District, um, which is north of of Napa City. And so it. it's fun where it's a southern AVA mm -hmm. influenced by San Pablo Bay, but here you have North Coast, which also, because it pulls the other AVA, pulls from Sonoma County, you have influence of the Pacific Ocean. Cool. So how do those kind of compare against each other? And both of these are, uh, we have you know, Cabernet, one has some Merlot in it, mm -hmm. but even though what's labeled Cabernet Sauvignon, there's some other grapes, especially in, in the Hess Select. Forgot to put out the bottles, bottles oh. for the previous, um, so I'm catching up with that. Oh. Oops, <laughs> <clears throat> maybe we'll show them later. Okay, so the first one we're gonna tear into is the Hess Select here. The Hess Select, yes. Okay. Do you wanna put the, the other bottle next to it since we're comparing? Yes. Hopefully the bottle cam can get this. How's that? Yep. Beautiful. Okay, so we've got the Hess Select. So North Coast AVA, both of these are tw 2019 vintage. So if you're doing this type of comparison at home and you're trying to dig down to see, okay, what is the sense of place based off of a wine label and production area, you know, having the same vintage can be very helpful because you're taking out vintage variation. And this is why I selected 2019 mm -hmm. for these two wines. Now the North Coast, you know, I should say, we're taking out vintage variation. Producer variation can vary. Mm -hmm. Oak usage, new oak versus old oak. Sure. Um, but for both of these wines, similar to the Riesling, we're getting a sense of, of Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm -hmm. Okay, that the black tea, a little bit of Earl Grey, English breakfast, mm -hmm. red fruits, black fruits, also getting some influence of oak, which is in the method of production for both of these wines. Certainly. But let's taste the North Coast. Let's do it. Delicious. D super delicious. Good tannin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Good ripeness of fruit. Yep. Um, confirming those berry notes. Now let's compare it to the Oak Knoll District. Which is Cabernet and Merlot. Which is Cabernet and Merlot. We don't and, know in what proportion, but. Right, and the first one is actually uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, a little Petit Syrah and Malbec. Oh, okay. The, for the Hess Select. This one's lovely. Mm -hmm. The oak intensity is a little bit more on the nose. <clears throat> It's a more elegant. It's kind of got a the the texture is different balance. on yeah, on the palate. Definitely, it's it's a little um, it coats more. Mm -hmm. It's um, I I, I want to say the tannin is not as gripping. That's right. As as the North Coast, mm -hmm. but we think about Oak Knoll District is is interesting because you have influence of the San Pablo Bay. You're at the southern part of Napa Valley. You have morning fog, which helps cool down the vineyards. But it is, stereotypically speaking, a, a ripe area. And we don't know the proportion of Cabernet Sauvignon or other grapes from the Hess Select that is sourced from cooler climates of Sonoma or even in Mendocino. What's the alcohol content of this? Um, you know, that's a really good question. I see 13.5 for the Hess Select. This is 14.3. 14.3, so a little bit more. Yeah. It's, you know, nothing. Yeah. Too crazy. Nothing too crazy. I was <laughs> I was thinking that it was a little crazier, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. And it's I think the average um, person would be like, oh yeah, or hi, even me. It's like these are great wines. These are great wines. You can both of them are wonderful to have at the table to eat with food. Um, I think method of production changes a little bit. More oak on mm -hmm. the second one. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit riper fruit to it, mm -hmm. uh, which also can, you know, be in relation to the alcohol as well. 
What about the prices on these? Do you re do you recall what you spent on these at the store this morning? Yes. Uh, the Hess, I want to say, was eighteen. Okay. Yeah. Well under um, twenty. The other ones what? And the others like twenty five. Okay. There you mm -hmm. go. Good to know. How much do those Rieslings run? Ballpark. Those are, uh, those are Rieslings. Plus, the right? Mosul was nineteen ninety nine. Oh. Um, and the Josef Hoffer was twenty six ninety nine. Great. Uh, these two are lovely, uh, the Californias. Let's go to let's go to South America. See if we can hit our next couple here. These are both Chilean wines. Tell us a little bit about big picture. What are, what are we dealing with in Chile as it as it relates to Appalachians, geographical indications, and so on? What's the scene there? Well, it's it's so hard because historically speaking, with Chilean wine, we just thought Chile, mm -hmm. and we didn't recognize or even fully understand all of these various growing areas mm -hmm. which you know similar to California really can change if you're growing right along the Pacific Ocean mm -hmm. it's much cooler than if you're growing at you know in the Central Valley or even in the Andes mm -hmm. and now as um, consumers are diving deeper into Chilean wines but also people are label you know Chilean producers are labeling they are celebrating much more a sense of place and I think it's really exciting in the market um, and what's you know don't be afraid to pick up and look at the back label don't mm -hmm. when you're when you're at the store you know yes you'll see Chile maybe on the front but really picking up and looking at the back label to see where it's from because they'll say uh, do or denominación de mm -hmm. origen mm -hmm. And that is giving a sense of where the wine or where the grapes are from. What about Argentina? Argentina is doing some interesting things with their wine laws as well. They have geographic indications, which would be much larger areas. Mm -hmm. And then they have DOCs, which we, of course, associate with European um, labeling. DOCs have specific grapes that can be allowed to use, yields, alcohol levels, um, even aging. Some have aging characteristics. Good to know. So what are we digging in, into so here? So we have here, and this is where picking up the back label is is important. So our first one mm -hmm. is the um, Conchi Toro, mm -hmm. uh, Casillo del Diablo. And on the front label, it's, it says Reserva, Cabernet Sauvignon, and on the front label, it just says Chile. But then picking up on the back label, mm -hmm. it says Central Valley or Val Central. Mm -hmm. And um, that is a very large growing area. Mm -hmm. So can we get a sense of place from there? Ah, that's arguable. Um, you, you can argue either way. Yes, it's going to be different than if it was growing right on the coast, but it's like the Central Valley of California. There's a lot of climactic differences uh, within it. You'll see this wine. Uh, this is around. Yes. Uh, this retails for about nine dollars. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Um, a lot of restaurants will carry this. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to pick this is because it's it's a very friendly wine. Mm -hmm. um, it's I purchased it for nine ninety nine today. It's juicy, mm -hmm. fruity. Um, we don't get an in, an intense amount of oak on this wine, um, but also you know considering the price point. Too. Yep. But then we're comparing it against the Echeveria, mm. uh, limited, I think it's a limited edition, uh, limited It edition. is. Yep. And it's from the Maipo Valley. Okay. So Maipo Valley, just north of the Central Valley, it's um, really, it's a smaller area. So again, going back to that sense of place. Yes. Both of these are, are Cabernet Sauvignon, but the intensity of the Echeveria is is richer. It's striking. Yeah, yes. it is. I was looking into my water cup for a second. <laughs> <laughs> but both of these wines are beautiful, and there is a place at the table for each of them. And... If you want to dig deeper into the place, in, and this is where also looking at, going back to producer always is the final note of quality, maybe they have growing practices. Maybe they're organic, maybe they're uh, biodynamic, something that you personally um, want to support in your, with your dollar. Yeah, there you go, thank you.
very different wine. Mm -hmm. Much more intense. Mm -hmm. um, again, aromatically intense. The color is much uh, richer. Mm -hmm. You're getting some spice notes. Yes. Um, the the oak, much more presence of mm -hmm. oak, very very well integrated yep. into the wine. Just looking at the color of these two. Yeah, just a lot, lot less fruit, peppery. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. But that one still is is twenty four ninety nine. So you think about. It's giving you more of a sense of place, but you're not breaking the bank. Mm -hmm. That's delicious. And that's where, you know, just looking at any of the wine labels, don't be afraid to pick up the back label. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, there's sometimes I've done that too, where I look at the front label and I'm like, where is this wine from? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, so much more information is on the back label. And just educating yourself. Do you like, you know, if you really, really love Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley, do you like the mountain AVAs? Howell Mountain, Spring Mountain, because you like fruit that's grown at higher elevation. Well, if you like that, then you can also translate it to some of, in, in Chile, the higher elevation uh, vineyards there as well. Right, and this becomes part of what you call your wine journey, exactly. right? Exactly. You, you, you start to figure out your thing. Yeah. And uh, it, it can go down to, you know, elevation <laughs> side of the river. <laughs> and you, you, you kind of start making yourself crazy. Cheryl is faculty author of several courses on wine and certificate programs offered through Cornell University. Well, um, you know, I know that there's a whole segment within your courses about reading the label and trying to make sense of that. Uh, there are also rules in presentation uh, around that, is there not? Uh, what do you mean in terms of like what you're allowed to put on the who's, label? Right, who's the winemaker? Where, where is that, the type of wine? Yes. Uh, the AOC information and all that kind of stuff. Yes. Um, every wine has to have a producer. Every mm -hmm. wine has to have um, the alcohol by volume. Mm -hmm. A wine does not have to have a vintage, though. Correct. If right. it's an AVA wine from the United States, then yes, it has to have a vintage. And this is where sometimes, depending on the classification of the wine, it might not list a vintage. Why, why, uh, so why not list a vintage? How does it happen? Tell, tell us what's going on from the producer standpoint. From the producer standpoint, it could just be a basic, basic table wine and mm -hmm. they blend. Yeah. And then right. there are some producers that do multiple vintage wines. Yes. Um, for example, Cane is a great example and mm -hmm. they have a multi-vintage blend that's just non-vintage. And this allows for, just thinking about the practicality of it, uh, consistency? Exactly. Well, okay. think about non-vintage champagne. Yeah. So non-vintage champagne, you have the wine sure. of the the wine from the year, and then yeah. you add the reserves. And there was a, a vintage champagne, or not a vintage, a non-vintage champagne that I poured the other day that had 60% of reserve wine from previous years blended in. Boy. But that's just to create a house style. So if I buy it mm -hmm. today, if I buy it five years from now, it tastes the same. Great. So we visited Germany. Uh, we checked out California and Chilean wines. Mm -hmm. Turns out China is emerging as a, as a potential huge player in the, in the short and long term. Yes. Uh, there is some really, really interesting stuff going on in yeah. the Chinese wine market, mm -hmm. um, in the production uh, and high elevation. Uh -huh. High, high elevation. Mm -hmm. um, in some parts of the country, they actually have to bury the vines in the wintertime uh, or in monsoon season to protect them. Hmm. But it's we are seeing some of the wines here in the United States and not that much. It's primarily for the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. But with those Chinese wines that are being produced, you have a lot of investment from large wine companies or beverage companies from around the world because they see the Chinese market as being large but then also the export market as well. Yeah, the seventh largest in the world or fifth, it depends on the source yes. and kind of where that comes from. Okay, well we'll be on the case when that uh, starts to kind of happen. Right? Yes. When we see some Chinese wines on the shelf, Sarah, we'll do a tasting. Definitely. Uh, as far as today, thank you so much for coming in and, and talking about designations, appellations, appellations and indications. And thank you. And I just want to say one thing, Chris. What? Don't be afraid to take out your phone and Google. Yeah. If you don't know a term or you think it's a place but you're not quite sure, I have to admit I do it myself. I'm like, I don't know what that means. Oh, okay. Google it. Your, your local wine shop will be more than happy to inform you and sell you some, some cool stuff. Exactly. Great. Thanks, listeners. Uh, we'll see you next time for the next keynote. Take thank care. Thank you. Bye-bye.